Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Dan Nguyen, and I'm the uh, director of the McGill AMR Center. And uh, it's really my pleasure today to co-host with uh, the Department of uh, Global and uh, Public Health, the seminar, special seminar with uh, Sanjuti Saha. And this came about when uh, Madhu and I were talking uh, uh, not very long ago about how can we talk about AMR on a global cell scale? How can we talk about it more at, uh, at McGill? How can we think about collaborations between the global north and the global south? And what came about was, well, let's first start having a seminar, uh, have us our special um, guest here and uh, a panel discussion as an opportunity to really have these uh, first discussions. And so I'd like uh, Madhu to come here and introduce our speaker. And then uh, following that, we'll have a panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dao. Uh, the pleasure for the new Department of Global Public Health to collaborate with the AMR Center on this special event. We have people in the room as well as online. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Shinjuti Saha, a friend and colleague. Uh, I've known her for many years, but this was the first time I've ever met her in person. So welcome. Um, so she is a PhD microbiologist uh, trained at University of Toronto. But for many years now, she's been living and working in uh, Bangladesh, her home country. Uh, she's the director of the Child Health uh, Research Foundation in Dhaka, uh, which uh, obviously, as the word implies, they do a lot of pediatric uh, infectious diseases research. They run a very important service lab uh, that manages diagnostic tests for thousands of children on a, on a yearly basis. Um, and not only has she successfully run this um, foundation for many years, uh, she's also a pioneer in sequencing. Uh, her lab was the first non-public lab in all of Bangladesh to sequence SARS-CoV-2. And since then, she's developed uh, enormous sequencing capacity in, in Bangladesh uh, for a variety of different uh, purposes, including AMR. Um, she is on the editorial boards of BNJ Global Health and PLOS Global Public Health and the first Bangladeshi uh, woman scientist to be profiled in the Lancet last year. Uh, and lastly, uh, she spends all her free time, which she has a lot of, uh, <laughs> running around Bangladesh, educating young girls on why they should consider a career in science and STEM. Uh, so she has uh, done more than 10,000 school-based uh, programs, uh, essentially encouraging uh, women and uh, to enter the field of science, as she will explain to you, there aren't too many role models uh, for them. And they also come and spend time at their research foundation, shadowing people just to see what the life of a scientist could look like. Um, and lastly, she's been an outspoken um, advocate for equity in global health. Uh, for example, when COVID vaccines were being rolled out and hardly anybody from Bangladesh was getting even one shot, she called this out and said, um, saying, why is this such disparity between countries in terms of access to vaccines? Uh, so a uh, fabulous uh, role model and a very inspiring scientist. Thank you. Welcome. Um, good morning still. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's good evening in Bangladesh or good night in Bangladesh. Uh, it's such a such a pleasure um, to be here today. I'm super excited. Uh, as Madhu said, I spent a lot of time in Canada, in Toronto. I lived for 11 years. So coming back to Canada is always uh, very exciting. And this is the first time I'm actually at Megal University. So thank you all. Thanks to all of you for even being here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work on antimicrobial resistance that we are doing in Bangladesh and how we are leveraging uh, genomics uh, to find local solutions for local problems. Um, so oh, Matu has already said, I'm from Bangladesh. That's not Bangladesh. <laughs> Pay attention. Okay. I know it's morning, but... Um, uh, this is Bangladesh. That was Bhutan. Do we have anyone from Bhutan here? No, so that was Bhutan, thank God. Um, so Bangladesh is the most awesome country ever. Obviously, I'm from there, right? We have around uh, an area of 148,000 square kilometer, a population of 170 million. I see many Bangladeshis there. Uh, we have an overall density of uh, almost uh, 1,200 per square kilometer. 
Let's compare that to Canada. Canada is a little bigger, uh, 9 million square kilometers. Uh, population, a little smaller, right? 40 million people instead of 170. And density is about four per square kilometer. Not a very big difference, but let's look at the city I come from, Dhaka. The population density of Dhaka is 38,000 per square kilometer. We are cozy. You know, we love each other a lot. We know everybody knows everybody. Um, so Bangladesh is indeed uh, one of the most awesome countries, if not the most awesome countries, because we are pro-vaccine. Uh, throughout the country, no matter where we go in Bangladesh, we see vaccine coverage of over 90%, actually in most places more than 95%. And if you just talk about MDG, we were one of the first countries to reach, you know, all health-related MDGs way before uh, our deadline, so ahead of schedule, and our prime minister even won awards for that. Uh, we have uh, the Child Health Research Foundation, where I work, we have the privilege of working uh, in Bangladesh, and really our mission is to uh, facilitate appropriate policy decisions through research and advocacy that impacts children's lives. Uh, we work, we've been working in Bangladesh since the 1980s, uh, and our headquarters is located in Dhaka, which is the capital city, uh, and with the high population density, and uh, from there, from the headquarters, we coordinate a surveillance site in four different hospitals shown over here. This includes the two largest pediatric hospitals of the country, um, Bangladesh Shishu Hospital and MR Khan, Dr. Emar Khan Shishu Hospital. In addition to that, we also work in Kumudini Hospital and Chittagong Hospital and all of these hospitals. Uh, we run the diagnostic facilities um, and we also run clinical surveillance of who are the children coming in to seek care, what kind of diseases are they coming in with. And because we run the diagnostic lab, we can also link uh, clinical data to laboratory data. Uh, and we are uh, you know, saving that information. So what do we actually do with all of the data for the last about 30 years or so? We have been conducting fever investigations, right? So we look at sepsis, typhoid, paratyphoid. And today, of course, I'll talk about AMR. We also do outbreak investigation. We work in hospitals. Hospitals, while we have some research priorities, but our research priorities are always driven by the hospitals we work with. If there is an outbreak, we have to work on that outbreak, whether it's dengue, chikungunya, or, you know, since 2020 COVID. Uh, I specifically focus on neurological and respiratory infections, so what causes meningitis in children uh, and um, respiratory infections caused by RSV, flu, etc. We take all of this data and try to work with the government to implement policy decisions. So for example, in 2009, our data guided the introduction of the hip vaccine in the National Immunization Program. Um, there was no idea that hemophilus influenza type B or HIB even exists in Bangladesh. Bangladesh. It was actually our founder who showed for the first time that hip causes meningitis in Bangladesh. And 21 years after it was introduced in the US, hip vaccine was introduced in Bangladesh, the first country in South Asia to introduce hip vaccine. Following it, other countries also introduced hip vaccine funded by Gavi. Similarly, uh, we uh, generated data on pneumococcal meningitis and pneumonia and sepsis. And it was using that data that PCV10, the pneumococcal vaccine, was introduced in Bangladesh in uh, 2000. 2010, again, in the National Immunization Program. So we have been working on antimicrobial resistance from, you know, as I said, the 1980s, but the way we are doing surveillance for AMR is gradually evolving. Um, so we started with just culture and phenotypic tests, right? We would do culture for bacteria and phenotypically we would look for um, antimicrobial susceptibility. In 2002, with funding from the Wellcome Trust, we first introduced, you know, PCR to look for certain uh, genes that can lead to antimicrobial resistance in culture negative um, specimens. But really, it was around 2015, 2016 that we started discussing how genomics fit in. How can we use genomics to also look at antimicrobial resistance? And in order to set up genomics in the country, we have been using or trying out many models. So we call it the trial and error models. And I'm going to take you through four models that we have tried uh, to really start or build genomics capacity in the country. And I want to tell you the pros and cons of them. So model number one, when we first started, we were like, well, we cannot really sequence everything in the country. Why don't we just ship samples to a collaborator in a resource rich country? Um, so that's what we did for our first sample. So uh, we actually detected the first ceftriaxone resistant salmonella type 
life in the entire world. We detected it in 2001. We didn't know what to do with it. You know, um, uh, in 2015, we actually, actually, I just gave it to a friend who works in UK. And it was like, can you just, you know, take the sample, sequence it and tell us where SEPT reaction resistance comes from. So a grad student from the lab sequenced it, did the analysis and we published it. And it was really our lab member also who became the uh, last and senior author on this paper. So it was the, it was an amazing experience. It was the beginning of an amazing friendship and we are still friends. We're collaborating on different projects. So, you know, we built relationships. So that was a positive of this, but con, there was absolutely no knowledge transfer. We are scientists. We're not in science to make money. The only thing we earn in knowledge, if you're not earning knowledge for something, it's pretty useless, I think. Um, so while we built relationship, there was absolutely no knowledge transfers. We were like, well, you know, that was one example of model number one. Let's try ship samples to a collaborator, but also get a student trained. So that's the second model that we tried. Um, so over here, you see, if you can see my cursor, this is Arif Tonmoy. Tonmoy is going to come up again and again throughout my talk. So Tonmoy did his master's in Bangladesh, but for his PhD, we built this collaboration with Erasmus University. So this time, not only did we ship, you know, 600 Salmonella typhi strains, we also shipped Tonmoy away. <laughs> and we said, hey, go hang out in France, uh, you know, see sequences and also learn large-scale bioinformatic analysis. And when I asked for Thornmoy to send me a picture, you know, ensuring that he's actually working there, he <laughs> sent me this picture you know, in front of car four so that I know he's actually there with his, you know, multicultural friends. Uh, and he did sequence all of those 600 genomes. He learned all of the analysis uh, and, you know, he published the first largest uh, collection of genomes of Salmonella typhi from one country. Uh, and, you know, he has been doing extremely well. Tonmo has now come back to Bangladesh with the skills, teaching the skills to the rest of the team. So this was a great um great model. We definitely got knowledge transfer. We learned a lot. We are building the next generation of scientists, but the moment samples get out of the country, someone else sequences them, uh, conversations become really awkward. Who wants the samples? Who wants the data? There isn't a clear right and wrong. So it's like, eh, not sustainable. Let's try another model, right? So we're still trying and finding uh, positives and negatives. So our third model was, we won't even send it to a collaborator. Who needs friends in life, right? Send it to a commercial entity, to Singapore, Hong Kong. Nobody will know who we are. We'll just get the data. And then now that we have people like Don Moy to be able to analyze the data, and by then another scientist, Yogesh Huda, sitting over here, had also uh, joined the team, we'll just do everything in-house. And this was super exciting. So, you know, I have been giving you examples of Salmonella typhi, so I'll continue with that. Salmonella typhi causes typhoid. And in the surveillance that we have been doing in all of these uh, in all of these hospitals, we suddenly saw emergence of azithromycin resistance in Salmonella typhi. Azithromycin resistance is very, very uncommon in Salmonella typhi. So this is um, kind of the numbers of Salmonella resistance we were seeing of the thousands and thousands of bacteria Salmonella typhi were testing. From 2013, we started seeing that azithromycin resistance is gradually going up. But the problem was there's absolutely nothing known about how Salmonella typhi becomes resistant to Azithromycin. So we were very curious. We're like, you know, this is our time. We have to sequence it and figure out how Salmonella typhi become resistant. So we shipped 12 azithromycin resistant strains to a commercial entity in Hong Kong. We got them sequenced. We started analyzing locally. And lo and behold, you know, in there was nothing in the genome that matched any known molecular mechanism of azithromycin resistance. So we actually discovered a mutation in an efflux pump that showed uh, that a mutation in this efflux pump called ACRB can actually lead to azithromycin resistance in Salmonella typhi. We did the sequencing, we did, you know, we did the bioinformatic analysis, but we also did laboratory experiments to actually show that when this mutation is transferred to other sensitive Salmonella typhi, it can become resistant to azithromycin, really proving that it's this one mutation in an efflux pump, right? And now all the softwares around the world are actually um, using uh, this mutation also to detect whether a genome has azithromycin mycin resistance or not. So that was really our first own project where we, you know, found, we, we collected the strains, we, you know, sequenced in a commercial, uh, through a commercial entity, analyzed the data and made a uh, big difference in the community of um, typhoid.
moving on, we also realize not everybody has the ability to, of course, sequence um, salmonella typhi because it's a disease that's endemic in low and middle income countries. Not everybody has a sequencer. So we also designed uh, basically a $1 uh, conventional PCR through which anybody can do uh, conventional PCR and see whether it has the mutation or not. And it's already been used by different uh, groups, you know, in Pakistan, India, etc. So that was model number three, worked out really well. We have our independence, right? Um, there were no awkward conversations. We paid the money, the data were transferred. However, again, not sustainable because uh, we have to ship the samples out of the country. We have newer and newer shipment rules, um, does not depend completely on us. And what happens when there is a pandemic? right? What happens? Where do you ship um, your unknown idiopathic respiratory samples to? Um, that brings me to model number four, sequence locally, analyze locally. So in 2018, so I moved to Bangladesh in 2016. I've been begging, 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 well, no, writing grants <laughs> uh, to get uh, our own uh, sequencing machine. And finally, I got a grant in 2018 uh, from the Gates Foundation, supported by Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, an initiative in San Francisco to actually get our own first sequencer. So pictured over here, it's a very, very small machine called a global sequencer, very cheap, like $20,000, $25,000. Uh, and... You know, the moment, uh, because I went to San Francisco, I trained over there, I uh, came back to Bangladesh to use the machine. And uh, it was like so much fun because suddenly we had this technology at our fingertips that we didn't even read about in textbooks, right, in Bangladesh. So, and it was at the hands uh, of the um young scientists at the front lines of public health. So really we were empowered, we were educated, we were engaged, and this is a picture. Even now, I'll show you more sequencing work, but even now, every time we do a sequencing run, we see the same excitement, right? Because this is something we are doing on our samples on site, we will be analyzing um, our data. Uh, in less than two years of getting that small sequencing machine, we did a lot. We sequenced pneumococcus, we sequenced dengue, first dengue sequence, for our our first RSV sequence, we did clinical idiopathic samples, um, CSF samples, and we sequenced also the first SARS-CoV-2 in Bangladesh. So very, very productive two years in a $20,000 machine. So in 2020, we graduated. Our donors were very impressed. They were like, man, you can actually do sequencing uh, in Bangladesh. So let's um, you know, fund you for the, the next machine. So then we got a Nexic 2000. So our next machine was a Nexic 2000 pictured over here. So oh, in that machine, we could do four bacteria max at once. Here we can do 400 at once, and it has to be in a temperature controlled room, et cetera. This was also funded by the Gates Foundation, supported by Biohub and an initiative. And what we are really doing is setting up in Bangladesh what we call the um, Child Health Research Foundation Infection Observatory. The idea is we want to make an atlas of all the pathogens that cause diseases in Bangladesh in children. And this is what the observatory looks like every time a child comes into the hospital. Uh, uh, clinical specimen is collected. We do a culture. If the culture is positive for a bacteria, it immediately goes through whole genome sequencing. Uh, if it is, you know, PCR positive virus, then it goes through viral whole genome sequencing. If it is idiopathic, then we cherry pick samples to do metagenomic sequencing, which I'll not talk about today, to find what are the pathogens that we are missing just by doing regular diagnostics. And they go through this entire pipeline that we have now set up, you know, from a uh, quality from library prep to quality control all the way um, to analysis. We now also have our own um, bioinformatics a pipeline for everything that we do and a team of data scientists. It's been an exciting few years. You know, I told you Thonmoy is back. Thonmoy has been extremely productive sequencing and also producing babies. This is his son. Uh, so Thonmoy has come back. Uh, and his son often now comes in to press start on our sequencing machine. We're okay. building scientists, as you can see. Uh, we have already sequenced over 6,000 bacteria, viruses, etc. cetera. Uh, we are starting to publish our uh, manuscripts. We were the first in the world to show that a virus like chikungunya virus, which we always thought only causes bloodstream infection, actually in children uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and cause meningitis. Uh, we have sequenced hundreds and hundreds of salmonella paratyphi A, and we uh, developed a software uh, called Paratype to genotype salmonella paratyphi A and also detect antibiotics 
antimicrobial resistance. So it's a very easy to use tool. It's freely available. Anybody can upload their genomes and get the genotype and antimicrobial resistance patterns of Paratype. This was our first, you know, I show a screenshot of this because when I went to Bangladesh, I was like, we can never publish in uh, journals like Nature Communications, but we did. And it's the first genotype being a software uh, that was developed by uh, low, by an LMIC. Um, so we're very, very proud of that. Uh, but for the remaining uh, minutes that I have for the rest of my talk, I'll not be talking about salmonella anymore. I'm going to switch gears uh, and I'm going to talk about Klebsiella. And I'm going to talk about the problem of antimicrobial resistance in um, Klebsiella. So now we are in model four. Remember, we are um, sequencing our own bacteria and we are analyzing them ourselves. We are answering the questions of our own problems. So we'll talk now about how this genomics capacity is really helping us uh, with the problem of uh, carbapenem resistance in Bangladesh. So I told you, you know, we work in this um, network of hospitals, uh, children are admitted, we do blood culture, CSF culture, etc. So over here is a sneak peek at the most common gram-negative bacteria that are detected in our surveillance platform. So you see in green salmonella typhi that I have been talking about and salmonella typhi more more or less has been consistent in purple we see acinetobacter, but really what has been uh, what has caught our eye is this rising uh, problem of Klebsiella infection. So in red uh, is Klebsiella. Most of them are Klebsiella pneumonia. I'll come to that in a bit. And we are seeing that in the, over the last few years, number of Klebsiella in, uh, is, uh, infections is increasing. Um, so Klebsiella pneumonia is a gram-negative bacteria. It's commonly found in the environment, can infect all animals. Uh, in children or immunocompromised people, it usually causes you know, pneumonia, sepsis, wound infections, urinary you know, tract infections, uh, but again, most common in immunocompromised patients and neonates. Neonates are babies in their first 28 days of life. Um, so this is the rising burden of Klebsiella. So this is a blow up from the slide I showed before. Um, so over the last 18 years, we have 1,461 cases of Klebsiella, confirmed Klebsiella uh, cases. So you're seeing data here from 2004 to 2021. And what we are also seeing Seeing is the odds ratio of dying after uh, a Klebsiella, confirmed Klebsiella infection is also increasing. So uh, we see that there was this increase um, in odds ratio uh, of death uh, around 2015. And I'm going to come back to 2015 in a bit. Uh, but we see this increasing mortality um, due to Klebsiella infections. Um, so as I said, most of the infections that we see are in children and babies in their first month of life. So over here is a stacked bar. In red are babies that died. Uh, in orange are babies that have adverse outcome. Uh, and then in green are babies that were discharged. But, but as you can see, about 40% of the babies with Klebsiella infection die. Uh, so uh, again, it's the first month of life. We can zoom into the first two months of life and we see it's really the first two weeks of life that's most crucial when these babies are getting the Klebsiella infection and um, succumbing to the disease. So to understand why Klebsiella infections are increasing, why Klebsiella infections are leading to more and more mortality, we decided to sequence um, Klebsiella pneumoniae. So we sequenced um, about 600 isolates representing the 18 years um, that I showed you. And really this work is currently being led uh, by my colleague, Dr. Yogesh Huda, uh, who um, also moved from Toronto and then the UK to Bangladesh to specifically work on antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I move on, there is something that I have to tell you about the founder of our organization and what really allows us to do um, such kind of work, because who has 18 years collection of bacterial isolates? especially in a resource constrained setting. So here is our Professor Shomir K. Shah. He's our founder and executive director. As you can see, he looks like a businessman. He only dealt with bacteria. Um, uh, I call him bacteria hoarder. I have been mansplained that it's not hoarding, it's called collecting. Sure. Um, so uh, he is 
really, really very, very particular about saving every bacteria that we get from um, these babies or these patients. And if you ever come and visit our research facility, you'll see you'll have rooms dedicated to biobanks. And all of these bacteria or clinical specimens are linked to clinical data, to full clinical data of, you know, why was the child admitted and what finally happened to the child. And for many meningitis cases, we do long-term follow-up of these babies. So when we join, this generation is really so privileged to have this biobank and go back in time and be able to answer very, very important scientific questions. Uh, we are blown how he even had that vision in the 90s and 80s of actually starting a biobank when biobank wasn't even a thing. So we feel, feel very, very privileged in addition to bacteria, we also uh, see viruses, clinical specimens, plural fluids, CSF, et cetera. So, you know, we went back to our minus 80 and we sequenced about 40% of all the Klebsiella cases. So over here, you're seeing, you know, they were randomly selected. So we have no biases, but they were all from um, babies under the age of two months. Uh, we sequenced them and then we analyzed them. So this is a phylogenetic tree. Many of you have seen phylogenetic trees, I am sure. Uh, it's basically a very pretty tree. And the only reason I'm showing you the trees to show that we can make trees. I mean, it's so hard to read these trees. Um, they are pretty colors, pretty circles. I'm just going to go back to bar chart. Uh, much easier to read. And I'm showing you the exactly same information. Uh, so over here, what we see is that when we sequenced all of the 600 Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, we find that the types of Klebsiella pneumonia are constantly changing. We had all of this hypothesis that perhaps these are hospital outbreaks. So one clone of Klebsiella is causing all the infections in each of these hospitals, but that's absolutely not right. A lot of these babies are coming from the community with the infections and the strains are very, very different. And also we see that there is this dance of this of different sequence types uh, of Klebsiella, which of course makes it very, very complicated to study, to prevent, to eradicate, etc. So uh, in 2021, for example, um, I'm trying to look for my uh, cursor. In 2021, for example, these were the most common sequence types, right? We see SD11 at the bottom. We see SD147, SD16, etc. However, the year, the two years before that, SD11 was the most common sequence type but it changed in 2021. And you can imagine this really, really affects the way we think of intervention, the way we think of vaccines in the future when strains are changing um, so much. Uh, when we look at, through the genomic studies, we were also able to look at, take a deeper look at the antimicrobial resistance of Klebsiella pneumoniae. So what I'm showing you here is again, a bar chart with temporal data on increasing antimicrobial resistance. And um, they are in, in Klebsiella, the, the, basically the way we look at antimicrobial resistance is giving them numbers, uh, which is generated by the software called, called Collaborate, developed by Cat Holt. Um, so zero or light pink means, you know, no beta-lactam or cholestin resistance. Darker pink means resistance to ceftriaxone. Blue is resistance to um, ceftriaxone and carbapenem. And then um, uh, black or three is basically resistance to everything and cholestin. And what you see is that this increasing resistance uh, to carbapenem in all the isolates that we were detecting in different hospitals. And pretty much around the same time when we saw mortality go up uh, is when pretty much all our isolates started becoming carbapenem resistant. So there's a association between, you know, the sudden switch to carbapenem resistance and sudden increase in mortality in the hospitals. Um, that what we were seeing uh, very similarly when we look at, you know, score versus mortality, we see um, carbapenem resistance strains are what leads to most death, uh, highest pr proportion of death um, in these cases. And all the four cases that were cholestin resistant had also died. So this shows uh, some correlation between antimicrobial resistance and death, but of course, you know, it's multifactorial. There must be other. Now we have done a lot more analysis to show what, while we know that antimicrobial resistance leads uh, to increased mortality, there are, are also other virulence factors that are also changing uh, in these strains leading um, to mortality. We also see that, you know, it's not one type of carbapenem resistance. Uh, so these genes that lead to carbapenem resistance, the mutations have been acquired at different times from different 
different strains. There are multiple underlying factors of this carbapenem resistance. Again, showing, you know, these are not just clonal outbreaks. It's an overall increase uh, in disease in Klebsiella. So to uh, disease in uh, neonates. So to prevent um, Klebsiella infections, because it's not only a problem of Bangladesh, it's a problem of many countries um, in the South, so in Africa, in India, in Pakistan, we are seeing very similar trends, rising uh, Klebsiella infections and new interventions are uh, being designed. So Gates Foundation over the last few years have invested very heavily on trying to figure out how do we prevent Klebsiella infections? Is it even possible to uh, make a vaccine? And so we are one of the countries that is contributing a lot to the design of vaccines against um, Klebsiella. So Klebsiella has an outer capsule and it has an O antigen under the capsule. And the idea is if we were able to design vaccines targeting either the capsule or the uh, O antigen. But in order to develop vaccines like that, you need multi-year data. So data from the last 10, 20 years because the capsule switches um, so frequently. And you also want data, you know, that's representative of the world and not just a couple of countries. For example, when the pneumococcal vaccine was first made, PCB7, that all the serotypes that were included in PCB7 were global north serotypes. And gradually, as more and more and more data came from the global south, different serotypes were being added. And now there's PCB10, 24, and there's more global south serotypes are being added. So very similarly, in Klebsiella, when the vaccines are being designed, we definitely want it to be as representative as possible. So we looked at the diversity of O antigen and K antigen, and we see that for O antigen, if we took the top 10 O antigen and made a vaccine against that, that would protect against 92% of the strains in Bangladesh. If we made a vaccine against the um, K antigen, which is the more likely uh, candidate, we would only uh, protect against 60% of the strains. But the problem is, it's not only sequence type, this capsules also change with time. So, you know, if we had a vaccine now, would it work next year? Would it work in the next decade, um, et cetera? So it's really, really important that we are vigilant. We are constantly monitoring how the capsules are changing, why they are changing, and cross immunity uh, by different antibodies, et cetera. And then I'm showing you only data from Bangladesh, but as I said, Klebsiella is a problem worldwide. And we did this analysis where we looked at all the serotypes, all the capsular types in Bangladesh and how they compare to different parts uh, of the world. And we see it's quite different. While you know countries closer to us have similar capsular uh, types, but as you go further and further, it changes completely. So scientifically, how do we figure out what vaccine to design, how to design it such that we get the most optimal coverage? Or should it be like local vaccines, you know, regional vaccines, etc.? Or is it a even worth making a vaccine? Will it even work? And another thing that I should also point out, I said that most of these infections are happening in the first two months, probably in the first few weeks of life. So it has to be maternal immunization. So there's a lot to figure out in this field um, of Klebsiella infections. And for me, it's been quite um, the learning experience. So, so far I've told you that prevalence and severity of cleft seal infections um, is increasing. Carbapenem resistance correlates uh, with increased mortality. And, you know, it's really important that we understand the genomic diversity uh, to be able to design um, interventions, make evidence-based, um, design evidence-based um, interventions. So this was all model four. I told you, I sneaked in a story in model four, right? So model four gave us independence. I mean, you know, I, I work in Bangladesh. I don't know if I stayed in University of Toronto, I would be able to do a study like this. We were able to do this because we had the dependence. We knew what the problem is. Samples were coming in, you know, we isolate that DNA, goes into a sequencer. Uh, my colleagues who deal with the patients were also looking at the genomic data. And I think that is uh, such a unique experience and opportunity to have uh, at work in Bangladesh. So it definitely gave us a lot of um, independence and rewarding, but there are cons too. It's expensive. We spend three times more money to do these uh, work compared to anywhere in North America. San Francisco is supposed to be one of the most expensive cities in the world. I pay for my experiments 
a lot more than San Francisco does because we don't have local distributors. You know, there are a lot of middlemen who import these regions and machines and they cut a profit. There's absolutely no cost control. Uh, we are not tax exempt. So it's very, very expensive to sustain. But of course, we cannot solve that here. I cannot solve that. I can only go and talk about the problem. Uh, but my another worry is, are we becoming too centralized? Because I talk about the colonialism in global health all the time and how we need to decolonize global health. But working in Bangladesh, sitting in Dhaka in a fancy you know, air-conditioned lab and doing all the sequencing, am I not? Or am I just, you know, replicating the global north, global south problem? So should we, you know, think about decentralizing already? Should everyone be sequencing Klebsiella? So that brings me to model five. Of course, I had space left for that. Uh, so and model five uh, is sequence locally and a share capacity. In other words, decentralize. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm almost done. I promise. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this program called Building Scientists for Bangladesh, through which we ensure that we are not the only ones doing science because then we won't be able to go too far in order to go far in order to ensure that there are real changes made in Bangladesh over the next couple hundred years we need generations of scientists uh, so we have built this hand-on genomics training program we had to ship Don Moy out to France and bring him back but we're like why can't we do this all in Bangladesh so now we have hands-on genomics training programs along with different universities or even you know privately people can come we have trained about four 400 people on different laboratory techniques who come in, spend a few weeks with us, they learn how to collect samples, go through the sequencing and also um, analyze data. So this is part of our building scientists for our Bangladesh program. And not only do they come for the training, what will they do with the training? We're also trying to set up other genomics lab across the country. As I said, Chan Zuckerberg Biohealth, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. I went there in San Francisco, learned, came back, and I'm like, what am I giving back? Can people come, learn, go back and sequence also? So with the support of FIND, we actually set up another genomics lab completely independent in Chittagong University. So I showed you where in the world Bangladesh is. So this is Bangladesh, and this is where Chittagong is, right by the Bay of Bengal. This is the Vice Chancellor of Chittagong University, and recently we inaugurated their first genomics lab. Uh, and uh, this is what, this is my lab manager, this is what the lab space we got along with the PI there, uh, Adnan Mannan. This is what it looked like in March 2022. This is what it looked like in May 2022. So they started with the exact sequencing machine that I started with uh, in Dhaka. Uh, and you know they are now sequencing their own Klebsiella. Uh, so from Klebsiella, they'll be sequencing other gram negative. And my deal with them is I'll support you for one year, give you all the support you need financial. Next year, you only get my intellectual support. You have to figure out how to run it. Right. And they are becoming self sustainable. And actually, so this is a PI Adnan Mannan, way better at networking than I am. And he's already getting grants to run this machine. His students are coming and, you know, because he's a professor, I am not. I work in a foundation. He has actually a much, much broader reach than I ever will. Right. So it's really a multiplier uh, effect. So this was the first run they did. And you can see how like nervous and excited I am. Yeah. Uh, so some overall lessons. We started with a good microbiology laboratory. So all our labs are uh, WHO invasive bacterial disease uh, surveillance lab. We have decades and decades of experience in doing microbiology. Right. We are not taking random bacteria and sequencing them. We built bioinformatics capacity before we invested on the machines. And I think that's really important. Technology changes so fast fast. If we buy a machine without knowing how to use it, how to analyze the data, then before you know, we learn, the machine is too old to even use. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to develop uh, data analysis capacity. Donor grants are <laughs> completely unsustainable. I am a part-time scientist, full-time beggar, sorry, <laughs> grant writer. Uh, uh, so we are gradually starting to figure out how to build revenue streams. So uh, now the small sequencing lab, now it has three um, sequencers. It's a full center, and we are actually getting getting samples from all over the country from different researchers to sequence their samples so they can um, analyze their uh, data. And we are a nonprofit model, so we can do a lot of things.
at cost at a very low cost and we are also uh, you know some of these training programs have not now become paid where people who can afford it actually pay to come um, and train so that helps give scholarships to students who cannot uh, pay uh, supply cost issues continue to remain a very very big problem uh, but I think it's something that we have to deal with people in the global south have to figure out how to solve the problem nobody else really can help um, in this case so I'm gonna um, end with a couple of perhaps models to think about when we think about uh, building capacity, when we think about building networks and working together. You know, these can be local solutions, it can be global solutions, you know, when countries in the global north and global south work together. So the most common model that is used in global health is the hub and spoke model, right? There's a hub somewhere, oftentimes in the main city or, you know, one country in uh, the global north, and there are all of these spokes uh, in the global south, right? But it's really the hub that kind of determines what happens uh, in the spokes. There is very little freedom uh, in these spokes. Um, now, opposite to the hub and spoke model is the traditional point-to-point -point model, where basically everybody does whatever they want. There is no monitoring system. Nobody knows knows what people are doing there is um it's not a good a network uh can go out of hands very quickly but what we are trying out at the moment and what we propose is this empowered or empowering spoke model where small groups whether you know different countries different cities within the country uh, have their own scientific freedom they have the capacity there's knowledge uh, transfer and knowledge sharing but at the same time they talk to each other but at the same time there is some kind of an evaluating or a monitoring team that ensures that uh, you know the data being analyzed makes sense you know everybody goes through QC all the time just like you know when we detect salmonella typhi we have uh, our quality control partners who ensure that is really really um, salmonella typhi, ensuring that when we sequence, when we say something, when we do bioinformatics analysis, it really matches uh, different indicators and metric. So this is something we are um, trying out at the moment. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I presented a lot of data. I didn't even do 1% of the work. It's really an amazing group of 300 people. Um, with a median age of 33, who does uh, all of this uh, amazing work across the country and um, our friends across the world who have been supporting us. So thank you. And so thank you so much for really a truly inspiring uh, talk. And, and I hope that this will kind of open up a lot of discussions and reflections, uh, both directly related to the ideas and the experience that you shared, but also you know, more broadly.